Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by Speedway Properties. If you're interested in these programs, please join our membership. The membership is available online at preservelincoln.org. Our speaker today is Jim McKee. Jim is a lifelong Lincolnite. His great-grandparents pioneered in Lancaster County in the 1870s. Jim has a bachelor's degree from UNL and operates J. and L. Lee Company, the publisher of regional books as well as the coinery, a stamp and bullion, bullion dealership. Jim has written over a thousand articles and books on Lincoln and Nebraska history. Um, he's on the Nebraska State Historical Society Board of Trustees and also serves on the City of Lincoln Historic Preservation Commission. He is also a founding member of the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Um, this is a series of talks titled Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln, and this is program number 27. Um, these, video, these programs are videotaped, and you can see them on the old Channel 5. They're, they're all, um, the channels are now different now, and also on YouTube. Jim invites you to ask questions during the program. Please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. A familiar house to many people and one which people are always asking me about. Uh, used to sit on the roughly the corner of 70th and O Street on the southeast corner of the intersection, which is not completely accurate. It did not sit on the southeast corner of 70th and O. Uh, and I'm not sure, I think later on we'll have an aerial view that may show this and may not. Uh, we think today of O Street as being the longest straight main street in the world, but it ain't. Uh, and part of the reason for that is we discovered recently the earth is round. So a straight line doesn't necessarily, when it's a straight line up, you have to once in a while have little correction points. I think one of those correction points is 27th and O Streets, where it just kind of corrects itself. Um, and we run into some interesting things, not a correction point, but at 70th and O. But if you remember this house, it sat back towards the southeast from the southeast corner of the intersection behind what was first a, swim, a uh, filling station and now uh, recently torn down and are being replaced as a savings and loan building. So it sat actually south and east of there. But if we were to look at a map of Lincoln uh, back in the 1920s, let's say, we would have found that O Street went to 70th and O heading towards the east, then it jogged half a block almost to the south and then it went approximately a block and a half east before it jogged back again to join O Street as we know it today. Uh, so O Street kind of took a little loop right there and it was right in front of this house. Uh, the reason it did that was mostly to enable it to cross Dead Man's Run along with the Missouri Pacific Railroad in one crossing, one bridge so that it sort of swung around there, much as it, uh, O Street used to jog a block and a half at roughly 5th, 6th and O uh, to avoid having to cross Salt Creek three times because of the cul-de-sac there. Same idea. We'll see that in a minute. So after the street was straightened out, it became the longest straight main street in the world. Probably uh, there's some people who argue with that, but today it pretty much runs from the Missouri River to a point almost directly north of the city of Milford. And by that time, of course, it straggled off into a gravel road. This house was uh, moved, purchased, and moved to a new location even further south and east, and now is a bed and breakfast some miles to the east of Lincoln. Uh, just before that, the house had been empty for a good long time. It belonged to a farmer by the name of Levitt, uh, and the Levitts sold the land roughly from O Street to A Street, from 70th Street to the east, to the U.S. Veterans Administration uh, to make the U.S. Veterans Administration Hospital, which is in fact what we really want to talk about. The house in the meantime had fallen into not disrepair so much as the fact that it did not have windows in some of them, uh, in some of the frames, and therefore when it rained and snowed, the water got in, a great deal of the woodwork was damaged, uh, several times people went in and tried to fix it, but it was a 
almost insurmountable uh, problem. So in fact, when the building was sold to the gentleman who made it into a B&B, he paid a very minimum amount for it. Um, and it was an interesting thing if you read in the paper. He paid nothing, I think it was, or maybe he paid a dollar until they picked the house up, put it onto 70th Street, took it south to A Street, turned the corner and headed east on A. And when they got to that point and it turned onto A Street, then his purchase came into effect because they wanted to be, he wanted to be able to prove that it could be picked up and moved without falling apart. Uh, so interesting. Uh, if read it in the newspaper, I think that's where I learned about it. In 1921, uh, President Harding established the Veterans Administration. Um, 1928, R. E. Campbell of Lincoln, who we think of as at that time being the head of Miller and Payne, uh, he he married a Miller, uh, and the Lincoln and Chamber of Commerce got together and raised a hundred thousand dollars to build a hospital. Uh, the land that the Levitt sold was approximately a half section of land, uh, and it was directly across the street north from the Eastridge Country Club, uh, which now has uh, development by Joe Hampton and his building right on the corner. Up until the time they built that building, you could still see where the green was that occupied that site in an aerial view. Uh, I don't remember the golf course, but many of you remember East Hills, the country club. That was the clubhouse uh, for uh, the golf course which sat there. And they maintained the clubhouse and the swimming pool for quite a while after that. Uh, both turned down, I torn down, I think Union Savings and Loans, that's approximately where East Hill sat. So Eastridge Country Club sat there. In 1930, uh, the picture we see here is the actual dedication, but in 1930, uh, Governor Art Weaver uh, broke the soil for building the Veterans Hospital. Uh, the original building, uh, which was 19, or had 11 buildings in it, this is the band playing on the uh, parking lot today directly east of the building while the dedication is going on. This is an aerial view. And if we look clear in the lower left hand corner, you can see the house on 70th Street and you can see how not only it's set back from O Street, but you can also see how O Street makes that curve. Uh, at first when I had this picture, I thought it was a cross section of one of my kidney stones, <laughs> but apparently not. Apparently is the actual uh, aerial view of the hospital and you can if you know how it's set you can see the circular drive which comes in and look at there a traffic circle and directly in front of the hospital uh, then it went all the way around the building uh, a little bit better close up of the property shows most of the 11 buildings and in this one we can see also where they had their own septic system and so forth um, nothing else was out there my house uh, that I grew up on uh, South Cotner Boulevard. If you went directly from our house on South Cotner Boulevard towards the east, you would have run across Earl Taylor's house, which sat where the village inn now sits. Then the next thing you would have seen would have been the Levitt house. There was nothing, absolutely nothing in between. Uh, all farmed by Earl Taylor, who lived in the house, uh, his parents' house actually, where the village inn sits now. So when I grew up, this was nothing but farmland, nothing at all. Uh, hospital itself, a little bit clearer here, uh, was originally built with a cupola on top, of course, called Colonial Revival Design. We're looking in this picture towards the northeast, a brick and stone structure which cost a million five hundred thousand dollars, four stories tall plus the attic. Uh, the frame cupola on top, the architect was W.N. Talbot. I don't know whether he was a local architect or not. I'm looking at Matt but I, or Jim. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, the first year, uh, they took in 1,400 patients, and these patients were taken all at no cost. In fact, some of the patients uh, which were taken into the hospital, instead of paying out, received a $6 a month stipend from the federal government. So a little bit different from what we experience today. Then in the 1930s, the south half of the property, and I guess we'll jump ahead and tell you this is where East High School sits today. The south half of the property, which went up to A Street, was actually leased out for farming. Um, also, we had on the property, of course, the house of the Chief of Staff House, which was the first house you would encounter when you entered the property. It's still there. Uh, then two duplexes for physicians. Then the next building was the nurse's dormitory. 
uh, and I was a good friend of the son of the chief of staff at one point. I was on the property, you know, dozens, scores of times, so I knew it quite well. Ultimately, there were 23 buildings on the property. They had their own water system, so they had a water tower. They had their own fire department. Ross Purcell was the head of the fire department. He was a lot of things, but he was the head of the fire department. They had a fire engine. Then after the uh, farming on the south, <coughs> roughly half of the property, um, one of the, I believe it was the daughter of the chief of staff at that point, convinced them to build a nine-hole golf course on the property. Uh, and I remember it sitting there, but n literally the chief of staff's daughter was the only one that ever played golf. Uh, very few of the uh, patients at the hospital played golf. There was also a tennis court, and of course this could be used by the, the nurses as well. Uh, with two wings built on the hospital ultimately, uh, it was a 280-bed hospital, so not a small hospital at all. Twelve physicians on staff, 25 nurses, and they also employed uh, from time to time. Many Lincoln physicians would also practice there. Uh, for example, when Arthur Godfrey needed back surgery, he came to the Veterans Hospital in Lincoln so that Dr. Gutowski could be his physician. So I'm not sure how all this worked, but private physicians were also called in from time to time. Then in 1951, the Veterans Administration built a new hospital in Omaha, uh, which is going to change the Lincoln Hospital function almost completely. Uh, 1956, though, they actually built onto the hospital again. Then in the 1980s, just to the west of the main building, out in what's now a parking lot, they put in a helipad. Uh, although I don't remember helicopters ever landing there, they probably did. They also put in a <coughs> intensive care unit. Then we come upon a point where the veterans or the federal government is going to first of all uh, deed the old golf course or the south half of the quarter section roughly to the Lincoln Public Schools uh, with the proviso that they build a building on it immediately. There was no need at that time for a building of any sort of school that far east of the city of Lincoln. Uh, to give you an idea, when uh, my house or my parents' house on South Cotner Boulevard was built because we were on the east side of the street uh, and we were the second house on South Cotner Boulevard, we weren't even in the city limits of Lincoln. Uh, so living there, I was supposed to go to Hawthorne School, but because we were outside the city limits, we were able to choose in a, uh, my parents chose Bethany, which was a little more accessible, so I went to Bethany School. Uh, and from Bethany, uh, I should have gone to Lincoln High School, but since all of the people I went to grade school with went to Northeast, I went on to Northeast, getting further and further north all the time. But the house on South Cotner Boulevard, by the time I was in high school, Southeast High School had been built. So that house was now in Southeast District, and I could have attended the last uh, couple of years of high school at Southeast, and kind of, in retrospect, kind of wish I had, but didn't. And the house now is in the East High School District. So without ever moving, I could have, have gone to or been lots of different districts. Um, so the Lincoln Public Schools not being interested in building a building on it in order to perfect the deed immediately sunk a water well on the property so that they could somehow claim the deed uh, without actually building on it. Um, that all happens uh, in about mm, the 1980s. Uh, and that we're, at that point we're going to sell the Levitt House for the first time, but it, the deed isn't going to catch until the guy ultimately later moves it. Um, 1998, the hospital function of the Veterans Administration actually closed, although it was used as it is still used as an outpatient facility, uh, x-rays and, and things like that. Um, the pe uh, people who would have been st patients there were bused to Omaha. And we'll have a question from John, I can see, in the, in the date probably when we come to the questions and answers. Uh, in 2017, uh, we began a project of building apartments on the same property but to the north and east of the old building, which are now completed. And I, I don't know, are they being moved into? I'm not sure, but I think they were trying to move into those properties. So we also have used a building out in Williamsburg, a huge building for the Veterans Administration. And Unclear to me why we don't go back in and use that veterans hospital to greater advantage. The upper floors, I think, are largely unused. The cupola was removed 
probably 35 years ago because it was wood and began to deteriorate and it's not been replaced. But the building itself, the grounds are, are completely intact. Uh, the nurses' dorm used for records and storage, the doctors' uh, residences and the chief of staff residences, the buildings through there but just used for other functions. Uh, and at least at this point in history, uh, it will remain part of the Veterans Administration sort of complex and where all the trees and grass are to the west of the building will remain for the time building. Meeting. So it'll be in a beautiful setting, but who knows what will happen next. In 1871, uh, George Harris came to the city of Lincoln uh, as the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad land agent. And we can think of his house as the Harris House down on K Street, um, a block, half a block northeast of the Capitol building, the Harris House. It didn't used to sit where it sits now, it's set on the corner, but that's where uh, George Harris will build that house uh, after a period of time. And being a land agent for the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad was a, was a good deal, uh, very, very remunerative. Uh, then, skip ahead in time to 1928, his son, John F. Harris, um, who was in New York City at that time, as I believe a stockbroker or a grain dealer, I'm not sure, uh, he asked a friend of his in Lincoln, uh, by the name of George Woods, to find 500 acres of land in or near the city of Lincoln uh, to be used to develop a park in honor of his parents to be called Harris Park. Um, another man born in Lincoln, Ernst Herminghaus, was born in 1890. Uh, he took a horticulture degree. Uh, his master's degree was from Harvard. Uh, where he studied under Frederick Law Olmsted, who was a great park designer of the day, probably the finest, if you will. Well, Mr. Woods has been asked to find his 500 acres of land in Lincoln, so he joins with Chet Ager and Mr. Herming's house to acquire land in 1929, roughly west of the corner, which is Burlington and Ponca Streets, which now we call Burlington and Calvert Streets, he obtains the 500 acres of land in there. And at some point, he decides not to name the park in honor of his parents, the Harrises. Instead, he uh, agrees to name it for all pioneers. So it becomes Pioneers Park. Uh, three different designs were made for the park, but ultimately Herming Houses, I don't know where the apostrophe goes on that, uh, but Mr. Herming Houses uh, design is accepted. Uh, and it is done, designed, if you could look at a map of it, with views directed towards the Capitol building. Uh, they then pan planted a huge number of Scotch, Australian, Pines, Colorado, Blue Spruces, mostly planted uh, as federal projects under the CWA and the CCC, or the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, the cost to Lincoln at this point in time for everything is $3,000. The federal government, of course, under those two auspices will uh, pick up most of the uh, cost. Uh, another 100 acres of land is then obtained by Lincoln's mayor, Vern Hedge, uh, and he announced that this would enable them to make a highway link uh, to the SYA. SYA means nothing to anybody, does it? The SYA was the Seward York Aurora Highway. Uh, Aurora, yes. <laughs> uh, and it didn't come about. Uh, and at that time, all of the highways were mostly named by letters like the O, L, and B, or excuse me, the DLD, Denver, Lincoln, Detroit, or Detroit, Lincoln, Denver, depending on which end you're talking from. Uh, but at any rate, that was one of the things they wanted to add the 100 acres for. They also plan to put caves along Haynes Branch, and these caves would be for an undesignated purpose. I, I never have figured out that they had any purpose at all. Uh, they also planned on building an amphitheater, and they also planned on installing dikes along Haynes Branch to back the water up, uh, to um, give a water source to the manufacturing of shoes. That didn't come about either. Uh, they also uh, had all, already, uh, there were brickyards in the neighborhood, uh, which have had many year, uh, names during the years, but now and for a good long time been known as Yankee Hill Brickyard. So the brickyards did develop, and also a very large stock operation 
uh, started on the Burlington Missouri River Railroad. Uh, today it would be more or less across the street and uh, southeast of the brickyard. So those things all developed. Uh, at one time, uh, they also purchased, uh, the gentleman purchased, uh, the buffalo statue to be put at the entrance. Uh, and it was, it had a terrible problem getting here, it got lost at sea. Um, and then later, in being transported to Lincoln, it was so heavy that the, one of the bridges collapsed. They were trying to get it out in the park too, but finally it was put in there. And at that point in time, they had a circle of trees around it. The circle of trees has long since disappeared. The CCC erected a water well with a pump to water the initial planting of trees. Uh, this uh, windmill stood uh, for a long time directly to the north of the original nature center out there, and it's now gone. Uh, it was never, as, we, as near as we can determine, ever really used after they sunk it because they realized that no sooner had they sunk the well, put up the windmill, and started pumping water, that it was in fact salt water, uh, which was not good for trees. And we do know that this land in that general area from the uh, state hospital towards the west is part of the saline lands uh, that will come into contention a little bit later on uh, when Capitol Beach begins to develop and those lands are sold uh, because clear back to the beginnings of the United States the federal government reserved all saline lands. So when the argument became when Nebraska became a territory and state and the land was transferred to the territory and state. The governor did not have then title to these lands, but nonetheless, he was selling them, leasing them. So there were all sorts of questions arose, but in fact, I don't think the federal government really cared much about saline lands. Uh, 1929 in June, uh, the Paul Whiteman Orchestra arrived in Lincoln to uh, do a dedication service at the park. Unfortunately, it was raining so hard uh, for such a protracted period of time that he and his orchestra got off the train in Lincoln, uh, gave a little concert in the depot grounds, got back on the train and left. <laughs> uh, finally in May, the park and uh, the golf course, Pioneer Park Golf Course, were dedicated. Um, this would be Pinewood Bowl coming up. Um, in the meantime, in 1935, I thought I had a picture, but apparently it doesn't come up in here. Uh, Ellis Berman, who will do several statues for the city of Lincoln, Rebecca at the well uh, in the Sunken Gardens, which has been re replaced by Rebecca at the well, a different statue. Uh, also, he will do uh, the War Memorial in Antelope Park, which still stands directly to the west of Alt Pavilion. And he will also do the Pioneer Woman on 33rd Street, which we've just built kind of a little gazebo and garden around. Um, Ellis Berman is hired to do the smoke signal statue in the park, uh, for which the city of Lincoln paid $50. Uh, this was another one of those federal administrations. Uh, part of the um, FE, FERP, FPRA, I don't know, it was an art section of the, uh, one of the many, many alphabet agencies of the federal government. Um, about a hundred American Indians came to the dedication of the statue and they camped out for several days on the site. Uh, then on September the 12th, 1935, the smoke signal, which we know today, uh, the 15 foot tall cast concrete statue was dedicated. Uh, by 1946, a north entrance was being planned for the park uh, and funds for the amphitheater were solicited. Uh, and that's just where we'll see Pinewood Bowl come into effect. A 30 by 40 concrete stage was poured and it was dedicated in 1947. Uh, retaining wall was built uh, from supposedly pieces from the old Capitol building. And I see it recorded, Matt, but I don't know where these pieces are or if they're still there or not. I don't know. Uh, supposedly were. And they said it would seat 4,000 to 5,000 people, which is, you know, it's easy to say because it was just wide open. Most of these people sat on the ground. Uh, hedges were later planted as wings. 1948, dressing rooms were added to the east or to the west or to the left in this picture. And benches for about 600 people were added, as we see here. 
and at that time another 200 acres is added to the park. Uh, in 1949, uh, in Pinewood Bowl, uh, Westland's Oscar Pop, ben, Pops Bennett uh, began his summer musicals on the ground. In the 1990s, a Prairie Interpretive Center was built uh, to the west, and 200 more acres of land were built. And of course, we have two different interpretive centers uh, now. The Hudson Cabin uh, was moved from the state fairgrounds, and the Heritage School was moved into the near those grounds. Um, and in 1946, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, 1990s, part of the 18, now I'm looking at Eileen, part of the 1890s uh, iron fence which went around the university were moved out here someplace at Pinewood Bowl, but I don't know where they are either. Um, they came from Ald Pavilion, University Ald Pavilion to the park supposedly, but I don't know where they are, so there's a project for us. Uh, also, at that point, uh, the, the park was added to the historic register, the National Historic Register of Historic Places. Uh, and if you go to something in Pinewood Bowl, you don't get quite as much interference from the overhead uh, jets as you used to because uh, only have local planes, but you can still get a little bit of interference uh, from them. Uh, this is the Ganter Block, which stood on the northwest corner of 12th and O Streets. Uh, what happened there on September the 17th of 1930 uh, is what we want to talk about very briefly here. But on that day, at two minutes after 10 o'clock in the morning, the bank officially opened. Uh, and at that point, six men entered the park, uh, excuse me, the bank, carrying what some people said were brightly colored pillowcases, other people said they were brightly colored sheets, but at any rate, uh, they went into the bank while a fifth man stayed outside uh, on the 12th Street side in front of their Buick automobile with his foot on the running board waiting. Uh, the outside man was a man by the name of Homer or Big George Wilson. He waited patiently on the outside while the folks inside were making a withdrawal. Um, only one customer approached uh, the gentleman standing with his foot on the running board. Uh, and he saw something was happening, but he wasn't sure what. Uh, and so I said he, but she didn't know what was happening, but went across the street into the building. It's Security Mutual, and then it becomes either Center Point or Center Stone, uh, the building which is still standing on the northeast corner of the intersection. She went into the then bank in the building and called the police department and said something is going on. Uh, the desk sergeant assumed it was a prank because she didn't know that anything was going on, but nonetheless, he uh, dispatched two policemen. One was a juvenile officer, a man named Peter Myers, and a patrolman whose name was Forrest Chapaw. Now, Forrest was a actual policeman, so he had with him a 38 caliber pistol. Obviously, the um, juvenile officer was unarmed. Uh, but they approached, and as they approached, they saw Big George standing on his, uh, with his foot on the running board, and immediately they noticed that Big George also had with him a Thompson submachine gun, which caught their eye. Uh, uh, and as soon as it did, of course, it's hard to say, but probably they were more galvanized than, than we might think, and Big George, uh, with great presence of mind, uttered one word to them, and that word was scram. Okay. <laughs> They scrammed. Uh, now at that point in time, of course he had only the one handgun, they couldn't have done anything probably anyway, uh, but they could not communicate with the police department other than one of those little boxes which they used to have scattered around the city of Lincoln, and there was none immediately at hand. So one of them acted as runner. He went ahead to the police department uh, as fast as he could go, and the other one followed on foot. That's about all we know. Inside the bank, uh, the gentleman who went inside uh, immediately get word from Big George to speed it up, speed it up. Uh, inside, they asked for a man by the name of Mr. Lionberger. We'll see how they knew all these names and everything probably in a minute. Uh, but, but Mr. Lionberger was needed because although banks 
you have this great door on the outside. Within the vault, there are also keyed entrances. So you have one door and then inner doors and so forth, which you need. And Mr. Lionberger has the inner combination. Uh, so the people inside tell the would-be bankers that they would just love to enter and, and open the vault for them. The outside door is open, but unfortunately, Mr. Lionberger has left, and he's left the inside door locked. And in order to show them that, they said, see, unfortunately, he had left, but he left the door unlocked. <laughs> so they did open the door. Uh, the vice president of the bank, a man by the name of Lucart, uh, uh, was told to lay down on the floor. Uh, and Mr. Lionberger was rather forceful about it, but uh, nonetheless, uh, they relieved the bank of $2,775,000, uh, 275,395 dollars and 12 cents, uh, quickly. Uh, by 1010, so within a very short time frame, reinforcements arrived at the bank from the police department. Within those eight minutes, however, the robbers were all gone, completely disappeared. Uh, and this amounted to, at that point in history, the largest cash bank robbery in the history of the world. Now, that's a great honor, so we don't want to let go of that if we can help it. And today, as far as I know, it retains that title, the largest cash bank robbery in the world. Now, there have been larger robberies, but not for cash and not from banks. We looked like at the, you know, in the uh, Heathrow, they uh, got lots of money, but it was from a bank, for example. So maybe we still have that honor, uh, dubious as it is. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened at that point in time, but two different theories sort of percolated to the top. One was that they got into the, ban the Buick automobile, which was on 12th Street heading towards the south. They got into the Buick, turned right or to the west on O Street, went one block, turned right or to the north, went one block, turned right on P Street, and headed to the east, drove the Buick into a moving van, closed the moving van, the moving van then turned right on 12th Street, drove back calmly in front of the bank, turned left on O Street, and left the city. Okay, maybe, that seems a little bit fanciful. Uh, but no more fanciful than the other uh, theory, which at that time uh, surfaced was, and that was they got into the Buick, turned left or to the east of O Street, and headed out of town, uh, where they were stopped someplace east of the city on O Street by a farmer because they had a flat tire. And the farmer helped them change the tire and asked them about the machine gun, which was laying in the back seat, and he, they explained that they were duck hunting. <laughs> Uh, and although he may have thought that was unusual, they went on. So, uh, you know, I don't know if the NRA was involved. I suppose you could be duck hunting. With it. <laughs> At any rate, at this point in time, I started eating lunch almost every day uh, with a man who at that time was called the Assistant United States District Attorney. I don't think that exists anymore. His name uh, was Robert Van Pelt. Uh, and Robert would say to me on a given day, come to my office and I'll tell you some things. And I would go and he would tell me part of this story. And he'd say, and that's all I can tell you now. But as people died, he said he would tell me more of the story. Unfortunately, Robert died and I probably never will get the rest of the story. Uh, but Robert Van Pelt's theory was that neither one of those two scenarios is actually what took place specifically, uh, he figured that they got in the car and headed for the Ozarks, just as quick as they could, headed to the south. And that seems probably more logical, although not nearly as much fun as the stories that were propounded at the time. Uh, late in 1931, a man by the name of Dewey Brulovich was arrested in Chicago. Uh, he was caught with $10,000 worth of Liberty Bonds. Now, Liberty Bonds are exchangeable without identification, so in fact, they were deemed as cash. Uh, and these Liberty Bonds were traceable. Uh, and he was trying to sell them to a New York attorney by the name of F.P. Ferguson. Attorney, F.P. Ferguson. So you've got to watch out for these attorneys because some of them 
are just as tricky as the robbers themselves. Uh, and Ferguson had already brokered or sold $15,000 worth of these bonds. So they kind of had their eye on him at any rate, but he said he came by them legally, but never offered any specifics on that. Uh, Van Pelt then teamed up with that time Lancaster County Attorney Max Toll. Um, and they both agreed that they thought Berlovich probably had not been a participant in the robbery. He was a well-known bank robber, but they thought he probably wasn't involved in that one. So Van Pelt then contacted a man at Northwestern University, a man by the name of Leonard Keeler, who had just invented something he called the lie detector, uh, which had never been used in a federal case up to that point in time, as far as I know. Uh, and they asked him to bring his apparatus, as they called it, to Lincoln, and they would use it on Mr. Berlovich. Mr. Berlovich saw this mechanical marvel, and he was petrified. I mean, he, he, he thought that something really bad could happen if they hooked him up to that machine. So he said he would tell them everything he knew if they didn't use that machine on him. And they didn't, they never did. He said that he was in Iowa during the time of the robbery and he could prove it, but that he would give them the names of people who were involved. Just don't use that machine on me. Uh, meanwhile, Gus Winkler, uh, who was one of Al Capone's lieutenants, had been taken to a Chicago hospital. He had been in an automobile accident um, and was injured, uh, badly cracked on the head, uh, and he began to mutter things about a bank robbery. Then he regained consciousness. And this attracted the attention of a group of Chicago businessmen. Uh, these Chicago businessmen had been working independently to nail the Capone gang. Uh, they were not being effectively dealt with by the Chicago law enforcement machinery, according to these gentlemen. Uh, their head was a man by the name of Colonel Robert I. Randolph. Most of these names are going to be nothing to anybody today. Uh, the group was called the Secret Six. Uh, and you can look them up, you can do a Google search on them, you'll find out all sorts of things about them and their attempts to uh, bring the Capones to justice. Uh, they together put up nearly a million dollars, and this is quite a bit of money in 1931, uh, to aid the federal authorities investigating bank robberies and organized crime in general. And they then, the Secret Six, sent their attorneys to the city of Lincoln uh, to aid in the investigation that Van Pelt and Toll were doing. One of the people that uh, Berlovich identified was a man by the name of Thomas O'Connor. Um, then uh, they found some other people, Jack Britt, Edward Harrell, William McQuillan, Howard Popley, and Tommy Hayes were all arrested in East St. Louis. Uh, East St. Louis was kind of not a garden spot at that point in time and well known as a hangout for all sorts of nefarious types. Uh, Britt was released after two deadlocked juries. Winkler was brought to Lincoln September the 16th, 1931. He was released on bond, uh, but Winkler brought his uh, alibi with him. He was in Buffalo. He had lots of people that said he was in Buffalo. Uh, and although it probably wasn't true, uh, they didn't think they would be able to uh, convict him. But in the meantime, Mr. Winkler communicated to Mr. Toll if he would back off all the rest of the investigations on him, he would return $600,000 in bonds and cash uh, with a letter saying that the balance of the bonds had been destroyed in exchange for Toll <laughs> releasing him or not charging him anymore, uh, dismissing all the charges against him. Uh, and although at the time Toll was highly criticized by a lot of people, he accepted the exchange and in January of 1932, a couple of different stories emerge here, exactly how it transpired, but uh, the one at the time which was generally accepted uh, was that at two o'clock in the morning in 1932 on a date certain, he picked up a suitcase leaning against a lamp pole in downtown Chicago, which had $584,000 worth of bonds in it. 
Well, the Lincoln National Bank, which had been the bank robbed, was uh, closed, uh, defaulted, of course, and Continental National Bank absorbed them. Uh, but at that time, a man by the name of W.A. Selleck worked for nearly 15 years uh, to clear it, uh, and ultimately, the depositors got everything paid back in full. Uh, Winkler and Berlovich were both killed in gangland massacres uh, in 1933. Um, and really what else happened, it's kind of conjecture. But one of the things we learned well after the fact uh, was that Lionberger had uh, some time before been approached by a man, this had been months and months before the robbery, maybe as much as a year, had been approached by a man who was selling safe equipment. And he said he wanted to come into the, to the bank and make an appraisal of their security system. Uh, and they figured out later that this guy was actually casing the bank, undoubtedly. Uh, and we have lots of names in there uh, of these people who were involved, but they, they don't really much mean anything today to anybody. But the Secret Six, uh, in their ultimate dealing with this, handled 595 cases. They had 55 convictions uh, with uh, total sentences uh, coming up to 428 years. Uh, ultimately, they recovered $605,000 worth of stocks and bonds. They saw 25 kidnappings and are considered to have smashed Capone's ring. Uh, Colonel Robert Randolph, Harrison Barnard, Julius Rosenwald, who was the president of Sears Robot Company, at least we've heard of Sears Roebuck. Uh, Frank Lesh, L-O-E-S-C-H, was an attorney. Sam Insel, who was a uh, utilities magnate. I don't know, he had a lot of interest in a lot of different utilities. Edward Gore and ja uh, George Paddock. Uh, they put up cash of $207,000 of their own money towards uh, this million dollars. Uh, and with any luck, we think that maybe, who knows, uh, our record is intact for the largest cash bank robbery ever. Um, a picture of Mr. Winkler in Lincoln, the guy who looks the guilty party with the little mustache is actually, that's an attorney, uh, his name is not coming to my mind. Gene, anybody recognize him? I can't remember. He was the Lincoln attorney that they worked with in Chicago. The guy in the middle that looks the dapperest uh, and he's the most guilty. So. We'll, we'll leave it at there. Uh, now, we are at uh, O Street again, and we're going to talk about this fire which occurred there. Uh, in 1945, a lady by the name of Maxine Runcie, R-U-N-C-I, I'm guessing at the pronunciation of her name, uh, in Lincoln, was a graduate of the Chicago Art Institute, and she had developed a doll which she showed to her aunt in Lincoln, Violet Gradwall and the Gradwall family we all know very well. Uh, the doll was based on a daughter or a niece called D-R-I-E-N-N-I-E -N -N -E, or something like that. I wouldn't even guess at the pronunciation. Runcie. Uh, that's who the doll was based on. Uh, Violet then incorporated a company to manufacture the dolls which she called Terry Lee dolls. It was Gradwall's daughter, apostrophe S, nickname was Terry, and Violet's maiden name was Lee, so hence Terry Lee. You're probably thinking Lee booksellers, right? No. That's not, okay. uh, the factory we see here was located at 2012 O Street, which would put it on the north side of O Street. Um, the dolls, most of the parts were ultimately manufactured by the Tip Top Plastic Company in Omaha. Uh, up until that time, they had been manufacturing the head and the porcelain parts of the doll. If you would look at a doll as being porcelain, they actually made them out of pressed sawdust until Tip Top came along uh, and began manufacturing the heads and hands, I suppose, at least, and the bodies from plastic. And Tip Top, in case you haven't heard it, was the largest manufacturer of certain type of cosmetic plastics like combs and so forth uh, in the United States at that time. And Tip Top had moved into the old Ford Motor Company um, assembly plant in Omaha. And today, the Ford assembly motor plant building 
is called the Tip Top Building, and it is has an architecture firm on the ground floor, uh, and the upper floors are apartments in what I would call near North Side Omaha. Uh, okay, the dolls were immediate success, and uh, uh, they sold for eleven dollars and ninety-five cents, which is a pretty good uh, sum at that time. They also sold them through Montgomery Wards, and in one catalog, they sold eight thousand dolls. Uh, then December, this picture, December of 1951. Uh, a fire broke out in the building, um, and they moved their facility then uh, to 4139-0, a building which I'm sure you're all familiar with today. I believe it is a, a vapor shop and, uh, and, and paraphernalia shop, which is occasionally closed and occasionally opened again by somebody else. Uh, that building really probably was built for Terry Lee originally. Uh, it had a steakhouse in it for a while. It had a lot of little things in it. It's a, just a, a flat one-story building. Then in 1952, they moved their factory to Apple Valley, California, but continued manufacturing the garments for the dolls at, there on the 41st and O factory. Uh, then in 1958, a fire destroyed the building in California. Uh, this is one of those things where you think the fire insurance company might be beginning to say, well, let's look a little more closely at this, but no, although there were rumors, nothing was ever proved. Uh, then in 1960, uh, through 1962, Terry Lee uh, licensed the manufacturing of dolls to another company, uh, and uh, there have been rumors of them going back into production uh, any number of times since then, but in fact, they never have. Let's see if we have enough time to cover this next one. We're coming up on the end here. This is the Lincoln Overall and Shirt Company building. Originally, they were in a building which I think we talked about last time, which was located where today's Stewart building is located. It burned to the ground along with the halter block, uh, and the Lincoln Overall and Shirt Company will move here. They'll also have a building down in the Haymarket about the same time. This is the building which today has Noodles Restaurant on the ground floor, Shea Hay is on the second floor, and the recently opened and the recently more recently closed Wahoo Taco Company uh, that's what's on the ground floor. You may remember it as the Rock and Roll Runza. Uh, I think the most interesting thing about the location, at least, is that uh, Block 315 in the city of Lincoln in 1867 uh, had an artesian well probably under the northeast corner of this building. It uh, produced what they at that time called a seven inch head of water. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it was a big flow of artesian water this water flowed from there uh, under what's now the, the old National Bank of Commerce building is now another bank. Is it still Wells Fargo? Banks seem to come and go so fast. Okay, it went under the Wells Fargo building uh, and then crossed O Street at a diagonal at 12th Street. Went to the middle of the block. Matt, your father knows all about this one. Uh, and drained into a open ditch, uh, which was the alley between N Street and O Street. And that went directly towards the west into Salt Creek, which was then covered with a uh, brick and stone arched tunnel, which is still there, uh, carrying water primarily, originally from that artesian well, but in subsequent years, uh, rainwater and storm water, uh, and is still there. Uh, so. This property remained unbuilt for a great long time uh, until several buildings were built, particularly at 13th and P. Uh, then uh, Lincoln Overall and Shirt Company, company which was at, uh, this would be P Street and 14th, was manufacturing jackets and apparel. Um, in 1905, the fire occurred. 1906, 1907, they will build this building. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the property did not stay there. Uh, they failed uh, shortly after World War I, and the building sat empty. Uh, in the 1920s, it became McKelvey Publishing Company, uh, which was, in fact, part of, and later to be known only as, the Nebraska Farmer. They will take over that and build a building uh, adjacent to it to the east. Uh, and at that time, they'll move into the new building. This building will become empty again, so it really sat empty for many, many years. By 1940, it was a Goodwill store. Uh, 1949, it was Nebraska Motor Company, an indoor used car lot. Then it became the USO, 
became a fraternity building, a fraternal, not fraternity, but a fraternal life insurance building. I believe it was the Eagles, uh, but I'm not sure. One of them went into that building shortly. Then it became the Rock and Roll Runza, uh, which was famous for having weights on skates. Uh, then the North Wall, if you go and look at it, had a great mural painted on it, sort of a skyline of the city of Lincoln. And one must wonder, is that artesian flow still flowing? Uh, it's possible, uh, but probably not to any extent, because artesian flows need to have an input of water, and it probably hasn't been much of that. The outcalled house. Uh, how much time do we have, John? Okay, we'll start it. Uh, in 1870s, a man by the name of R.C. Outcult uh, moved to Lincoln. Uh, he was working for the Sweet and Brock Bank Company. I think, Matt, you wrote this up at one point in time. Uh, it later became the State Bank of Nebraska uh, and later the uh, State National Bank uh, in 1872. Um, Mr. Outcult in 1878 joined another bank called the Marsh Brothers and Mosier Bank. Not necessarily a good move. Uh, but in 1882, Mr. Outcall purchased lots, two of them, on the northwest corner of 11th and D Street and built this house. Uh, completed in 1884, two and a half stories, Queen Anne, um, Marsh Brothers Bank in the meantime became the Capital National Bank uh, with Mr. Outcall as the cashier. Mr. Outcall became the president of the bank. Then in 1893, the Capital National Bank closed in receivership for, in quotes, dishonesty, end of quote. We'll leave it there. Uh, in fact, it's said that the bank at that time also held $53,000 in totally worthless paper, which had been signed by Mr. Outcalled. Mr. Outcalled and Mr. Mosier disappeared from the city of Lincoln. I can't remember, did some of them get free lunches courtesy of the federal government? I think one of them. Mosier did, yeah. Now, in the meantime, another man comes along, and this man is considerably more reputable, very, very well known, a man by the name of Frank Hall. Uh, Frank Hall had graduated from Peru Normal School, then attended the University of Nebraska Law College. In 1888, Hall and his wife and Charles Gere, together with 65 others, formed uh, a society to build an art museum. They first called it the Hayden, H-A-Y-D-O-N, then the Nebraska Art Association, then in 1894, Mr. Hall bought the old outcall house, uh, he having disappeared. And he also put a three-story addition onto the house. About 1900, he built a gazebo behind it uh, and added onto the house again. Um, his law firm, like any attorney in Lincoln, I think, can trace their, everybody was in a firm that was a part of a Judge Pound, I think, so Roscoe and Steve Pound, his father. They all seemed to come together it's like architecture firms. They just keep going on and on. But at any rate, the law firm today would be known as Klein Williams Johnson Wright and Old Father. So uh, a very, the probably largest law firm in the city of Lincoln. 1928, Mr. Hall died. Uh, and only a short time later, a few months later, his wife passed away. They had in their collection 200 pieces of art. And they left those 200 pieces of art along with a $70,000 trust and a 10,000 annual gift uh, to the Art Association. Uh, in the 1930s, this house was purchased by Thomas Perkins Kennard's daughter, and she started a tea room in the building. Thomas Perkins Kennard is the first Secretary of State of Nebraska. Uh, 1935, Leo Bartunik bought it, converted it to apartments. He paid $9,000 for the house. Uh, 1989, Bartunik's daughter and son-in-law, uh, Peg and Emil Bartunik, converted it to a bed and breakfast. In 1998, it was placed in the National Register of Historic Places. And in 2007, 2007 it was offered for sale for $375,000. It has changed hands again since then. But the house is still there. Uh, and this is not a very flattering picture of the house, so you need to go down and take a look at it. Uh, this is looking more or less at the uh, east elevation of the house, so it's looking at the back and side of the house. Uh, time for a few questions. Uh, seeing we have none, I will thank you for your attention, uh, and uh, we will meet again here a month 
from today exactly, is that right? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>